who else? Um, use honey to get the garlic down when you have a cold, Jessica. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to get that spicy, pungent ingredient. Yes, um, Richard, did you have a question you wanted to put forth? Um, no, I actually was referring, going back to the previous discussion. What, uh, what do you do with it? I mean, how do you eat it? The garlic uh, combination. Oh, so, so far I've just been having it uh, as a little garnish on the side with uh, some cheese and other, you know, can't remember what they call those things at the coffee or wine bars and stuff, but, you know, little, little tiny accoutrements. Tapas. Of, yeah. Tapas. <laughs> yeah. Um, Antipasto. That's back to oh, right. Yeah. The Italian version. Yeah. Reminder to anyone who's like just getting ready, like we're gonna start in about four minutes. Water, you definitely wanna have water. I'm partial to warm water. Cold water is hard to melt chocolate after you've had the cold water. So at least room temperature or warmer is good. Um, what? Yes. Yeah, take half the samples. Um, yes, so does it, are there any more questions? Just remember to have your water, assuming you have your boxes. Um, I need half of those samples left, Carol. <laughs> Um, I'm assuming you have your boxes sorted and your little tasting card and pen if you want um, to write on the back of the on the back of the uh, tasting wheel that I sent. Um, anyone else have questions other than the garlic honey question? This was new to me. I had not thought of garlic and honey yet together. We'll just do a couple more questions before we get started at two. Any other questions? You can either put your physical hand up or put your virtual hand up and we will call on you. I'm looking for oh yes jen i'm just wondering uh how you get different flavors from the beans to come out or be more prominent rather than others hmm that's a good question so there are several different processes there's several different things that will dramatically impact the flavor of a chocolate you have the genes the genotype you have how the cacao is grown. In other words, the the okay. you know the weather conditions, climatic considerations, whether or not people are fertilizing, um, how much sun you're getting, how much rain you're getting. These are all extremely important, and some might argue the most important things. Uh, certainly, when it comes to wine grapes, there is a huge amount of annual variation that's related to weather. Um, so, as a, a winemaker might like to believe that they have the most impact on whether or not uh, you know a particular wine is delicious but you could argue it's mother nature um, you also have when it's harvested is it perfectly ripe that's incredibly important and then there's post-harvest which is you know fermentation and drying primarily and and so so far from beginning to end the outcome of the chocolate has already been dramatically determined by these other steps. Um, and so when cacao would come into Patrick chocolate, I would do an assessment, which would include a cut test so that I could see internally how much um, enzymatic browning had occurred. So chocolate, cacao beans start out kind of a, a whiter purplish or pinkish color. They're not brown. And so by the time you get them, if the, the internal color is still highly purple, then that means that part of the process during fermentation and drying probably wasn't carried out as well as it could have been. And so it can tell you a little bit about, you know, the potential of the bean, so to speak. Uh, you can smell them to make sure that they smell generally good. Uh, you know, are they fruity? Do they smell like honey? Do they smell like a dirty sock? Is it time to start? Did I talk too long? <laughs> is it, uh, I'll keep it, I'll keep it short. Is it time to, uh, or is it, is it smelling a little bit moldy? And uh, at this point, if everything is smelling good, you can go ahead and proceed through the roasting process, which itself is incredibly complex. And I think we're going to be talking about that um, in large part today. So I just want too much detail. But I, so I would say all of that's incredibly important. And there's more, uh, there are more parts of the process as well. But for a chocolate maker, there we go. you know, I've, I've come to believe flavor wise, you know, 
setting aside texture, flavor wise, roasting is well, roasting and formulation are probably the two most important elements. The so formulation being choices about uh, percentage cacao, what type of sweetener to use, whether any other flavors uh, are going to be added. You know, for example, historically, vanilla was something that was always present in chocolate products. Uh, and it's not so much the case these days with craft chocolate, but um, I think most people are familiar with that vanilla and chocolate kind of pairing. That was very long, sorry. That was, you know, that was a very, a very complex question. So I think that, you know, three minutes was pretty concise actually, because um, that's something that you could talk about for a long time. Um, okay, so look, we are at two o'clock. Uh, it turns out I realized that I have the power to mute you. So I don't have to ask you all to mute. If you don't mute and I hear background, I'm just gonna mute you. Um, no offense, please. It's just that with so many different background noises from so many different people, it can get pretty tricky. Um, yes, Janet is just posting in here, posting where she's from. If you want to let people know where you're coming from and where you're joining us, that is welcome. Um, we've got Janet from Maui and Karen from Jackson, Wyoming, and Karen from Seattle are all there with uh, Janet in Maui. You're welcome to post that. What we're going to do is we're going to get started. I love it. Everyone's putting their, I'm going to try not to pay attention to the chat right now so I can focus. Um, we're gonna get started so we run on time. I know, thank you for taking the time. I know here it's a gorgeous day. I'm thinking it might be in Palo Alto and Bay Area as well. So thank you for joining us on a Saturday afternoon. Um, I am welcome to changing the time. I'm welcome to open, I'm, I'm open to people's comments about changing the time if there's a better time, but I feel like too early in the morning is not so great for eating chocolate and sometime in the afternoon after lunch is not a bad time, not too late because I know it keeps some of us up. So it's hard to find the right time. Um, so hopefully this works for, well, whoever's here and the ones who aren't here, it didn't work for. Uh, so I am Sunita de Touré and I um, am based in Palo Alto. I used to run the Chocolate Garage. I see many familiar faces. It's so nice to see you. Um, it's been many years since the Chocolate Garage closed. Um, so mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm going to just give you a little bit of background for myself. I like to call myself and I do consider myself a recovering scientist. Um, that has meaning to me in terms of what that means. But um, I started the Chocolate Garage back in 2010 and uh, closed it in 2018. And uh, many of you here on the call know about the Chocolate Garage and were part of the exciting sort of collaborative spirit of the Chocolate Garage where we were able to, through our unusual business model, um, directly crowdfund many, many bars into existence. Um, Deanna, who's on the call was saying, what was that crunchy, nibby, salty bar that she so loved? And it was the Rio Crunch, which was early, early on. It was a Rio Caribe bean with nibs on the back, um, a Rio Caribe bean origin with nibs on the back and salt. And it was an absolutely fantastic bar. Um, so the, the Chocolate Garage was a wonderful place of gathering for both community who were local as well as a way for us to connect with makers and even at times directly with farmers in terms of um, helping crowdfund certain bars into existence. Um, my background in chocolate, uh, I guess I've done a bunch of judging since we are here to learn how to taste like experts with some experts. Um, I've done a lot of judging up for Northwest Chocolate Festival now called Chocolate Alliance. Um, Good Food Awards judge for many years and then uh, actually uh, ran the Good Food Awards chocolate category for three years with Chloe Dutroussel and Carla Martin. Um, what else? I guess the most important qualification, I suppose, is that at the Chocolate Garage, one of the things we did is we really curated very, very specifically and thoroughly for both quality of the chocolate as well as where the, you know, what was the story behind it? Was the supply chain looking transparent and, and happy and was everyone getting served up and down the supply chain? So that was how we curated chocolate at the Chocolate Garage and that was what we termed happy chocolate. So um, the way we did that was to do something like we're doing here today. We would have samples, blind samples of different bars, um, usually a group of at least four or five, sometimes eight people. We would all come together and everything would be labeled in terms of letters. We would taste six to eight bars, not too much more than that, because that became a lot of suffering and just too much. Um, and we would go through the bars and everyone would bring their particular palates. We had a super taster. We had folks who were like, like any... Um, 
any person, we have very different palates, different abilities to taste, different sensitivities. So collectively, we were able to like speak to the chocolates that we were tasting and um, make sure that the bars we brought in were excellent. So um, I've got, well, on my screen, I've got Claire here, who's um, part of those tasting circles, as well as Deanna, um, who joined as well. And I don't think I see anyone else here who was joining locally, but uh, there's two pages and it's a little hard to move between. So that's my introduction. And then we have Alan McClure here, who, if any of you all were chocolate garagistas, um, I would be surprised if any of you never bought his bars because there's just something for everybody. He made excellent chocolate, whether it was single origin or beautiful milks or dark milks or inclusion bars that brought together flavors you never imagined could work together and were geniusly put together. Um, I think that Patrick Chocolate is certainly, I could say without a doubt, the most chocolate I ever sold was Patrick Chocolate. And, um, and it was, you know, again, when people came in to choose chocolates, they always got to taste before buying. So it was purely based on the experience of the bars. So, um, so Alan is, I will just give you a little background because a lot has happened since he started Patrick Chocolate. He is a professional food craftsperson of 15 plus years experience in the field of chocolate and confectionery. He has a record. It has not been beaten by any other food producer at the Good Food Awards. So the Good Food Awards um, awards folks in lots of different food categories. I don't know exactly, I can't remember now the number of categories, but it grows every year. And he has a record that no one else has beaten. In 10 years, he got 26 Good Food Award wins, which means multiple awards every year, consistently, every single time he submitted bars. Um, 18 categories this year. Thank you. That's right. We have folks here from the Good Food Foundation. This is perfect. <laughs> I got all the brains to tap. Um, so, um, and just by the way, you can submit three bars a year. So it means he, two out of his three bars in most years, and he could give you the more specific stats. I'm kind of pulling numbers out of the air here, but would have won every single year. It's pretty impressive. He completed his food science PhD. So he went back to school to get a PhD while he was still making Patrick chocolate. And the, he worked in the fields of flavor chemistry and sensory science, investigating the impact of cacao roasting on bitterness and consumer liking. I think those two things are quite uh, interesting to pull together. So not just bitterness, but also, you know, what our mouths, what consumers are able to experience, not just measured by, um, you know, a, a complicated machine. Most recently, Alan has established a consultancy focused on food and beverage formulation for the cannabis industry, and he's working in all kinds of areas. So if you have folks that are starting up a business and really wanting to nail whatever it is they're making, whether it's beverage or a baked good or confectionery, whatever it is, there is no one that I know that would do a better job of like mastering and understanding um, the topics. And if you have any doubt, go onto his Instagram page, which is Foodcraft Science, I believe, at Foodcraft Science. Nod, yes, yes good. Yes. And you could just scroll and you'll be like, what? He made this type of cheese and that type of cheese and this type of whatever, whatever you can possibly imagine, he's pretty much probably made it um, multiple times and perfected it, not just made it, because you know, we can all make something badly once, right? <laughs> um, so yes, as I sort of said, tasting is very subjective. It's genetic. We've got genetic differences. We have different palates. We also have strong preferences. Um, so just keep that in mind as we're tasting. And the idea here is that just like in many other industries, we talk about flaws that you might find in a wine or flaws that you might find in beer and what can go wrong in, these food, in this kind of food production. Um, that's part of what we're trying to do here today is really look at what is a delicious, beautiful chocolate? What sometimes might go wrong? Sometimes it's already in the bean when it's received because those are being fermented and processed usually at origin before they come to the chocolate maker. Not always. In some cases, we actually have some folks um, on who, well, we have one folk on, Mr. Seneca Klassen, who he can, he's directly blamable for his beans because he grows and ferments them and then has to make chocolate with them. So, um, oh yes, before we go any further, I want to just, point out a few of the folks who are here in the chocolate industry. <clears throat> um, so I already mentioned some of the old garagistas. Uh, I have a fellow, I'm looking at my screen here, I have a fellow retailer, Maya, who is down in Santa Barbara. Um, so Chocolat Maya, if ever you're in Santa Barbara and you need a good hookup to beautiful confections or a beautiful craft chocolate, go to Chocolat Maya. That's, that's your spot. Um, 
We also have Taylor Kennedy who can maybe wave. Hi, Taylor of Siren Chocolate. Um, you all may remember Siren, it was a bright yellow package. Um, one of the first bars that we tasted of his at our fifth anniversary was uh, Guatemala two different ways. So he used uh, cane sugar versus maple sugar, a little heart, you know, point and tap tip of the hat to the Canadian maple syrup sugar stuff. Um, and that was a really fun because it was basically the same percentage, but just two different sweeteners used. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers that bar, but that, that he used to do bars where there was always two bars in one package. Mm -hmm. So you could always do a little comparison. Um, let me see. We also have uh, Seneca Klassen, as I mentioned, from Lonohana Chocolate, as well as Onomea, another brand. Um, and then we have Estelle Tracy, 37 Chocolates. If any of you want to check out and read more about chocolate and check out her blog, 37 Chocolates. We also have Carla here. Hi, Carla of Opening Chocolate. Um, you can also check out her work. And I see more friendly faces. Brian um, Bikey, who uh, used, we did a podcast. Well, I shouldn't say it's totally in the past tense. Who knows what will happen? Our podcast is paused for now, but we had a podcast together. Um, and then more familiar faces um, in terms of um, old customers, old regular customers. Um, I think I've got everybody. Please point out to me if I, oh, Amanda. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> uh, please point out to me if I forgot. It's kind of overwhelming, all these different um, screens. So I guess an important thing to point out is that for those who joined later, that I hope all of you have your boxes. Um, perhaps you might agree with me here that the most important person to have a box uh, today would be Alan, since we're kind of depending on his palate. Um, and it may well still arrive while we're on the tasting <laughs> currently, but it is ah. still in transit, unfortunately. Um, both FedEx and USPS are, are, have failed me miserably. Um, yeah. so, can you hear me? Right yes. Now? Okay. Yes. So to be clear, you sent something well ahead of time via USPS, which did not get here. And then you caught the fact that it wasn't going to arrive on time. And you sent another package overnight, FedEx, which should have arrived yesterday and still did not. So I really want to make the point wow. that you did everything within your power. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Yes. And you know, if there is some chance that it will still arrive with perfect timing. I don't know if it's perfect. Well, it'll be like, well, Larry, last minute, perfect. But what I thought we would start with in any case is to start talking about the roasting because every month we want to focus on something and do a bit of a deep dive into that particular topic. So what you have in your box are the A through F samples. And then there's two little packages of nibs that have different colored washi tape on them. So the light roast is the one with just the light little lines, the little stripes. And then the dark roast is the one with the diamonds on it. So what we're gonna do, and so these are, these are nibs. There may be a few husks in here. Um, these are nibs that are roasted by uh, Lono. I asked Seneca if he would roast us two different versions of nibs so we could see like the same cacao roasted two different ways. Um, uh, I, if there are any husks, it's my fault because um, I had to take out the extra husks because it wasn't at the level of, you know, anyways, it doesn't matter. I won't give you all the details. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to taste these two different beans. And because Alan can't taste, he's just going to have to like pretend and listen to us. I'm going to call on Seneca last minute to, to um, make an appearance and talk to us about his intention. So what's really interesting is that Seneca moves, works more in a very intuitive way in terms of roasting and he roasts it in a way that he feels is gonna result in the bar he wants. Alan is much more methodical and information based. And I'm, you know, I don't mean to make, this is like both are very valid. So Seneca is gonna tell us what his intention was uh, uh, behind trying to roast these in two different ways and what he's trying to get out of the different types of beans for bars that he makes. And then we're gonna have um, Alan also tell us a little bit Maybe we'll start with Alan telling us a little bit about basics of roasting, and then we'll taste these two and have Alan sort of speak to maybe the science behind what Seneca is doing in an intuitive way um, through his roasting. Does that sound good to you, Alan? And do you think it makes more sense for us to um, start by tasting or have you do a little basic and then have Seneca speak to what his intention was? Do you have a sense? I will, uh, I will just very, very briefly make a comment and then we can taste and then after Seneca, I'll maybe add something. So roasting in the chocolate industry can be done several different ways. There's whole bean roasting, there's what's called nib roasting where the, the bean is cracked apart, the shell's removed and the nib is roasted in smaller pieces. Um, and there's 
it has been developed something called liquor roasting, but to the best of my knowledge, it's not, uh, it's not commonly used even by companies like Calibo, which is the largest chocolate manufacturer in the world. Um, yes, the world, uh, 70% of all chocolate or something like that. So, um, roasting is applying heat in the simplest way, applying heat for a certain period of time to whatever it is that you're roasting. So whether that be the whole bean or the nib, um, and it can be done in a variety of different ways. There are things that can be important, such as how quickly you're ramping up the heat over the roast. Uh, the course of the roast, which you could uh, you could plot and call the roast profile. There's also uh, how much moisture is in the cacao and to what extent the moisture is removed before roasting starts, and many many other things. But put simply, craft chocolate makers almost always roast the whole bean, and the idea is that in various ways they're applying heat over time to develop additional flavors in cacao and to remove certain other flavors while at the same time drying out the cacao for further processing into chocolate. Great. Okay. Um, Seneca, do you want to tell us and actually um, tell us if you think we should be like, you know, take, maybe it's be good actually for both of, for all of us to sort of pop up in our bags. I don't know if you've already put these out on a plate or something, or just have them in their, in their pouches, but when you open them, just Smelling the difference between the two. Gosh, those smell really good. Um, smell the light roast and then the dark roast. Give that a whiff. And then um, from there, we'll go on and continue. They're definitely very different. We'll continue from there. So Seneca, tell us what your intention. I mean, I asked you for light and dark roast, but you already were doing a lighter and dark roast for different bars, correct? Yeah, we have a pre-existing set of profiles for lightness and darkness, and they break down for us in the two product lines that we do now. Lonohana, they're our original product line, which is really kind of a fine chocolate focus, and Onomea, which is um, a sweeter, uh, more candier confectionery focus. Um, it's the, the, the two things basically different. Lonohana focuses on the flavors of the cacao itself and trying to deliver information that's directly related to that. Onomea is more about chocolate as a base for flavor operations. So the chocolate needs to be, the chocolate itself needs to be slightly more basic, slightly less like full of really pointy features that are gonna stick out and kind of interact not so well with those other flavorings. And so we worked for quite a while to develop a darker roasting profile for the Onomea line they really are very similar cocoa beans almost all the time that we're talking about. So the roasting profile is taking very similar source materials and trying to move it in different directions. Darker is kind of a funny way of putting it because actually the, the roast profiling for the Onomea line is lower temperatures, but it's a lot longer. So we think of it as darker because the flavor ways that it tends to enhance and bring out are richer, more cocoa-y, a little more a little more just chocolate and basic and not focus so much on the volatile components. And maybe if, if something's very citrusy or tangy, we don't want so much of that in the Onomea line. We might really want to preserve it on the Lonohana side, but we have to work this balance. So lower and slower is kind of a one way to think of darker in our world. Alan can probably expand on whether or not that's a consistent thing. I don't really know, to be honest. It's, this is like where it gets very intuitive for me. So I'm, I was trying to find ways of working with the cocoa that we produce that would allow it to work better at a sweeter balancing point. And because the Onomea lines are, we're talking about dark chocolates that are in the like 55% range. So really quite sweet compared to like an average of maybe 70 or plus on the Lonohana side. So a lot more cocoa content. So for us, those, that, that darker roast profile is actually like a low and slow process and the lighter roasting profile is really a little more aggressive temperatures, but a much briefer time. So we're ramping up the time, the curve of the temperature much more quickly, and they're in there a lighter amount of time. Whereas on the dark side or the Onomea side, we're ramping more slowly to a slightly lower set point, and we're taking a lot longer to hold them there. One of the other aspects that gets involved in this too, and Alan will be way better at speaking to this, is overall bitterness in the final 
chocolate. So this is something that I've been learning slowly over time, working with these lower and slower, darker roasting profiles, is that it, one of the one of the big effects of it is it, it it does seem to my palate anyway to really bring bitterness lower, which in a fine flavored dark chocolate where you're really trying to explore terroir is not necessarily what you want. But in a system where we're trying to kind of generate a base of operations that we can flavor and amend and work with as a as a <laughs> a, a basic ingredient that we can play with. We do want a slightly more neutral flavor profile and bitterness is one of those components that we want to actually decrease. And the, the, this, this darker roasting profile seems to decrease bitterness overall for us on the on a male line, which is a positive when you're talking about sweeter things that are more kind of confectionery or candy focused. So that's okay. the, yeah, that's Just, the overall spectrum. So as Seneca is talking, I think I see some of you tasting. So I just tasted the light ones to get a sense and then um, maybe taste the darker ones um, as, as loosely as I'm using those words. Alan, do you wanna chime in? And just, I didn't really say this because I, I don't know, I guess I just assumed everyone knew what nibs are, but nibs are cocoa beans that have been roasted in this case. And then the hull, the, the, the husk has been taken off. So it's just broken bits of cocoa beans. So no sugar. So I'm sorry if any of you were thinking chocolate when you put the nibs in your mouth and were surprised by how intense they were, but these are just like the, the pure um, cocoa beans that, you, that you're tasting. Um, Alan, do you want to chime in and tell us, and actually Seneca, are, you were too busy talking, but um, if anyone wants to throw in, and I do see there's questions about what temperatures roughly and what kind of roaster, which we'll get back to in a second. Um, but if you all want to write any kind of difference between the light and the dark in the chat, please feel free to say what you might taste. And if you recognize what Seneca was saying in terms of like a more cocoa-y, classic chocolate flavor in the darker roasted ones versus a little more nuances and different like pointy edges in the lighter roast. Um, feel free to put those. So the light, the this is the light roast is the one with the little stripes. Sorry, I ran out of letters that were pre-printed. Um, and then the dark is the diamond. So think of diamond equals dark. <laughs> And the light roast is the very gentle stripes on the on the paper. Um, Alan, do you want to chime in? Yeah, so I want to give people an opportunity to really note what is happening in their mouths right now. And perhaps um, I don't know if any questions are coming in about that 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 Seneca could answer. I'm trying to make uh, a little figure, a chart, a graph that can refer exactly to what Seneca is talking about because uh, it just so happens that everything he was talking about is what I spent a huge amount of time working on uh, for my PhD. So I, I can draw something here really quickly, but I, I'm tending to think in Celsius lately. So I'm trying to convert to Fahrenheit very quickly. So one second. Um, actually, as, <laughs> you, Al, as Alan- You were happy, you were like, I was. Celsius. I don't understand Fahrenheit still. Um, as Alan is doing that, um, thank you, Kurt, for saying what you taste there. Sharp, bright, juicy as the as the lighter one, and the dark is more cocoa and dense. I definitely get that too. I feel like the dark ones are more, they taste almost like toasted nuts. They're almost nutty and toast, kind of like nice toast flavors. By toast, I mean like bread put in a toaster, those kinds of flavors. Um, I, should, I should maybe jump in and point out that the cocoa that we produce here in Hawaii is not super amenable to like really true traditional chocolatey flavors. So even when we go to the darker side of it, it does, I think that's exactly what I would describe it as. It gets nuttier. Um, it does get roastier, but it doesn't get as chocolatey as some other places. And that has everything to do with what Alan was saying earlier. It's all terroir effects. We just we don't at this time, at least in our farming here on Oahu, we don't grow super chocolatey chocolate. <laughs> we grow very bright, acidic and juicy chocolate, which I love. But when you um, when you make these kind of more like chocolate chocolate products, it can be a little bit interesting and challenging because they don't necessarily register exactly where people expect them to. I'll just answer those two questions really quickly too. The, the temperature is roughly in Fahrenheit. So on the, on the darker roast, we're talking about like 240 to 250 Fahrenheit. And on the lighter roast, we're talking about maybe 275, 280. So these things move around slightly, like Alan was suggesting, like we're always assessing. And for us, it's so lot dependent because everything is very micro and very variable. So we're looking at like the moisture content of the beans when they come in, the, when they're coming out of the bag in the factory. So we have a certain moisture target when we pull things off the drying rack, but then we have to check again 
when we're pulling things out of bags to, to know kind of where we're starting in terms of moisture content because that affects our roast timing. Um, yeah, so that's that's the, the rough range of temperatures. So really like we say roasting in the world of cocoa, but often we're talking about really much lighter temperatures than people imagine when they hear that word, I think. When they, a lot of people, when they think of roasting, they think of coffee, they think it's really like aggressive temps. We don't really do that in craft chocolate for sure. Um, it tends to be very mild on the temperature side. And our, as far as like style of roasting right now, for us at Lonohana, Lonomea, it's convection ovens. It's simple, really, really basic baking ovens and perforated sheet pans. We will in the next few years probably move to what's called a Scirocco, which is a traditional ball roaster. Um, and that will be a cool development. But for now, um, I actually really like uh, tray roasting and convection ovens because it's very gentle. The beans are not agitated at all. And that's um, super helpful for this thermal integrity and averaging out what's being cooked. So anytime you start agitating cocoa beans and they get really dry, they can break fracture very easily. And then if you've got tiny little pieces, they're uh, obviously they start roasting at slightly different rates and you got all kinds of things. So I don't like I don't like repurposing coffee, coffee roasters, for instance, for, for cocoa roasting. I don't think it's a great call because you've got tumbling and that's not ideal. So ball roasters, roasters that are traditionally designed for cocoa do this <laughs> motion. They're, they're gently, the, the beans are, are being tumbled inside, but very gently agitated. Great, thank you. And actually just a quick pointer in case you didn't see the chat, Brian, who is in the coffee industry is saying that um, it, for comparison with coffee, you're talking 315, 320 Fahrenheit to get through the drying phase temperature before they go into development, which I mean, I assume means development of the roasting. So even higher than that. Thank you, Brian. Um, Alan, did you finish creating a live chart for us? That I, you're did. Gonna... <laughs> I did. Do you need to screen share? Um, well, actually, I, I did it. Can you see this or no, it's not going to no, work. Is you it? disappeared. Everything disappeared, including you. Let me see if I can. I just enabled it for you, uh, all participants, but please let Alan screen share, not anyone else. Go ahead, Alan, if you can. One second, well. Um, and as you're doing that, so yeah. Ah, oh, okay, it's go. just a hand-drawn one. Okay, good. Yes. Perfect. Is that big enough for you to see it? Yeah, pull back a tiny bit and everyone, maybe I'll pin you so that, um, so that everyone sees you if you're not already. There we go, perfect. Yes, that's perfect. So this is a roast profile idealized. You have temperature on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and every there all the different combinations are possible. And you could go on for 240 minutes or you know two days. And in fact, there uh, Steve DeVries, old retired craft chocolate maker, he used to roast overnight at uh, very very low temperatures. And you can see much higher temp uh, much higher temperatures on the top of the y-axis 350. You can go higher. But this encompasses not only the common roasting profiles, but many, many that would be considered uncommon and bizarre. But what Seneca is talking about, and it's not exact, is that the point of the triangle that's that's pointing away from the y-axis, that that would be one way of looking at the dark roast, which is a very long roast at a relatively moderate temperature. And you could even bring that point down to, to lower the temperature even more. Whereas the point that is uh, up at the top closest to the y-axis, that could also be considered a dark roast, but it's at a much higher temperature for a shorter period of time. Mm. Um, and then I, I put a little asterisk in the middle, which might signify you know, a, a a moderate roast. You could even lower that temperature down or lower the the um, the time and temperature down. But at some point, and I'm gonna, my uh, deltoids are starting to cramp. Um, at some point, you are going to run into a problem where the temperature is so low that a lot of these the compounds that are produced during roasting that make chocolate taste like chocolate are not being produced anymore. And in my research. Um, we discovered that that is right about 212 Fahrenheit, uh, where you stop seeing anything below that producing much of what you would consider to be a chocolate profile. And you can imagine that the reason is that's the boiling point, meaning that uh, a lot more water is being held onto uh, below 212. And um, there are a certain number 
of compounds that are being produced, even with a slightly higher moisture content in the cacao. But until the cacao starts to dry, some other ones, some of those other compounds are just not really being produced in any large, um, to, to any consequence. So I guess what I'm saying is, I completely agree with everything that Seneca said, um, because we saw it in all the samples and all the treatments that I produced. And, and so in that way, it really is kind of meaningless, except in the most general sense to talk about dark and light rose. And we're not trying to, to fool anyone here, um, but it's easy as a shorthand, but dark roast could be any combination of times and temperatures, which, which give you something that is either uh, like Seneca described, you know, very straightforward chocolatey with very few origin characteristics or something much closer to coffee, which would be similar to like a French roast profile uh, or some of the French chocolates that are being made where they hit it hard with much higher temperatures and you start to get like a burnt peanut flavor mm -hmm. um, which you don't really get from the more moderate temperatures anyway I, I can add a lot more but I think that is one thing that is often overlooked uh, by people is that you can do short time high temperature or more moderate temperature longer time the other thing that I would add is um, anything from raw up until that 212 doesn't change uh, hardly at all. The bitterness and the astringency and the acidity and the sweetness barely change at all. And that consumers across the board did not like it in comparison to any of those other roasted treatments, whether it's the the ones that are closer to the light or the dark that you're tasting right now that Seneca just described, so. Great, Alan, um, thanks for that. Um, so Kurt, I see your question um, and I wanna hold it till the end just cause we're gonna have a Q and A at the end which is a very specific roasting question. And I wanna make sure we have time to get through the chocolates as well. Alan, did your package arrive? Not yet, no. no. I'm gonna let go of that. <laughs> <laughs> let go of the hope. So um, if we're okay with moving on to these and then saving any specific roasting questions, I certainly learned that my whole labeling of light and dark was actually very amateur and doesn't actually mean anything, which is good to know. Um, so we can dive deeper into that towards the end. So if you want to um, clean your mouths out, nibs are, are pesky this way. They get stuck in there. And, and um, so you might want to have some water and make sure your mouth is free of little bits of nibs. Um, Seneca, did you have anything that you had a burning, did you have any burning things you wanted to say about roasting before we leave roasting, just in I terms just of what Alan to, said? I just wanted to object to your characterization of your own observations. <laughs> it's still, I think it still matters. Like it's, it's a weird spectrum to talk about because sometimes, I mean, I think when we say dark and light, your imagination immediately fires in certain specific ways and they're not quite correlated with what we're really talking about but these but those terms still mean something and right. i think like even though we're talking about lower temperatures longer time and higher temperatures shorter time what we say is a dark roast still it to me i i still would agree if i ate those i think neutral as a neutral observer i still feel like the experience was darker was deeper you know and so i think there's still useful terms in as a way of describing the spectrum but they're not necessarily, they don't mean like what you might imagine that they mean in our specific food prep world. That's all. Right. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, I think another way to put it would be, you know, if you're comparing lightly roasted cacao to raw, darkly roasted cacao to raw, those things have a meaning that's more apparent. But as you start talking, as you forget about raw, and start thinking just in the sense of how to define a roasted cocoa bean. It's, um, I think there's some precision that could be gained if we add some additional you know, terminology to our discussion of roasting. And I'm not suggesting I know what that terminology is. I, I did not develop anything really. I just know, I know from my experience, there's a difference and I know also that uh, like what Seneca said, it is true that it seems dark <laughs> compared to 
uh, compared to other rows, and yet at the same time different than you know the other points on the triangle. So again, I don't, I'm not sure what to do about that that issue, and it's probably not even particularly relevant for most people to even lose any time thinking about it. But but if you are if you are roasting or you're trying, you know, if you're trying to be an expert in roasting, it's interesting to see that. Um, and it, you know, I would say I might have had some sense of that before my research, but I don't think it was that incredibly clear to me before, you know, we actually got into the experiment um, that that's, it was so clearly both somehow dark and yet totally different than the other dark, if that makes sense. Right. Well, so my takeaway here is that like all things in cacao and chocolate, it's all incredibly complex and you could spend a whole career and lifetime deep diving into one element, just like roasting, for example, or fermentation. So, um, so this is what we do here is we dip our toes a little bit in a topic and realize that we actually know very little, we being me and maybe some of y'all. Um, okay, let's move on to the tasting of the bars. Um, we're gonna start with A and uh, the way I would encourage you to taste is, um, so what I've done is that the sticker is hiding the front of the bar. For those of you who know different brands and might be influenced, that's how it is. So the back, what you can actually see. Yes, Alan, you have a question? Can I throw one other quick thing out there? Yes, please. Okay. So in coffee, they talk about this a lot. It's not talked about as much in cacao, but it's absolutely relevant. And Seneca talked about it I don't think he used this, the term that they use in coffee, which is origin characteristics. So you've got origin characteristics and roast characteristics. In coffee, it's, it's far more obvious what's going on because the, the green coffee really does not taste like coffee at all. Um, whereas cocoa beans, there's still something to the raw bean that makes you think a little bit of chocolate. Um, but one thing to keep in mind when you're tasting all these samples is if you're tasting the acid, you know, the tart qualities, the fruity characteristics that Seneca was talking about, um, it can be citrus, it can be any number of different fruits, then usually you're going to be referring to those as origin characteristics because they're there already in some way. Um, and the roast characteristics are usually due to non-enzymatic grounding reactions. Sorry to spew that out there, but you might, might have heard of Maillard or Maillard reactions before. And that, it, that actually, and I wanna make this clear too, that is an umbrella that encompasses literally millions of chemical reactions. So when someone says, oh, it's the, the Maillard reaction, it is not a single reaction. This may sound like this is a huge pet peeve. It's not, it's just, I was really, I was thinking about that today. It is a term, a term that encompasses millions of reactions that are, for all intents and purposes, still little understood and are only, to any extent that we do understand them, it's because of Dr. Hodge who worked for the USDA out of Kansas in the middle of the 21st century. Um, one of the most important food scientists who ever lived, also a black scientist, which is interesting given the middle of the 20th century. Um, but he had a huge impact on food processing, this, the understanding of food processing related to roasting. Um, and, you know, it was a great, great scientist. Um, and so I would say, keep in mind these two things, like one direction, which is more like fruity, bright, acidic, and it's not, it doesn't always have to be really strong, but I'm just talking about that you can note some of these characteristics. The other direction, which is less that, and more like roasted nuts and roasted coffee and brownies and espresso and things like this. And if you think of those two things on a continuum, you can really be anywhere in between those. And of course, if the post-harvest process matters, the, the genotype matters, as I mentioned, but you are going to find sometimes that a roast profile is such that the cacao is tasting like something very pungent and powerful that really has nothing to do with the roasting at all. And that's, that would be origin characteristic. And so in that case, that would have been a decision on the part of the chocolate maker to roast extremely lightly so that those volatile compounds are not driven off 
nearly to the extent that they would be due to the roasting process. And Seneca, you know, he really did talk about this a lot when he was comparing light and dark roast, but I just, just wanted to mention that again. So we can think about light and dark, we can also think about origin characteristics and Meyer the reactions on the opposite side. And it's not a perfect model, but maybe helps you to wrap your mind around some of what's in your mouth. Great, thank you. That was very helpful. And actually, before we leave the nibs, I wanted to mention for those of you. So these are these are Hawaiian nibs, and if you think of like price per kilo or per metric ton, these are some of the most expensive nibs that exist because of the cost of living and the cost of labor in in Hawaii. So these are precious. I wanted to give you some ideas of how you might use them. If you know you don't want to eat them plain, you can sprinkle them on a salad. You could make uh, like a butternut squash soup and infuse cream with the nibs, or sprinkle them on top of the actual soup if you want to get fancy. Um, you could also uh, put them in smoothies, you can put them in pancakes, you can put them in cookies like chocolate chip cookies, just give you a few ideas. So eat them. They're really actually very good for you. When people talk about health effects of chocolate, this is like pure health, just because there's no sugar and other things that are maybe not so great. Um, now I'm going to do this on vanilla ice cream with a bit of olive oil. Yes, a little bit of salt on there too. Mm, that's delicious. Um, as we taste, because Alan doesn't have the box, I'm gonna do this tasting a little bit differently because I was wanting it to be totally blind for Alan. Obviously this is not blind for me. I have to prep the chocolates and send them out. But since he's not tasting, I thought as we taste A and B, they're kind of a pair. Um, I was gonna put you on the spot, Alan, since you just talked about origin characteristics and inspired this idea to tell us a little bit about this origin if you can and what you know about it. I don't believe you've worked with it, but I'm sure you've heard about it. So the first two bars are the same origin. So that's kind of neat because it's two different versions by two different makers of the same origin. I'm not gonna tell you the percents, let's just say it's the same origin for now. And Alan, it's Camino Verde. So it's Vicente Norero's cacao from Ecuador. Um, so whatever you want to say about that. And then um, while we taste, let's taste A and B. And what I'd love for you to do is, if you can, take small pieces so that you can taste multiple times or at least twice. Um, so break off a piece, give it a sniff. As you break it, that spot where you broke it's going to be a nice spot to smell because it's just been opened up and hasn't oxidized and might give you a little bit more flavor. And then put it in your, well, so sniff it, um, notice the snap, if you know, the temper, put it in your mouth. And if you're patient, let it melt or give it a couple bites to break it into a few pieces and then let it melt. And then notice the flavors as, as time passes, right? So notice what you get up front, notice what's happening in the middle and notice how it evolves over time. Stuff can be very different at different times of um, the melting and the experiencing of it in your mouth. Um, I'm just gonna give some terminology here. So you have your tasting wheels, which I haven't referred to yet, but there is just help if you want in terms of identifying flavors you might be tasting. I'm sorry, they're so small. You might need to put your reading glasses on. I know I do. Um, you don't need to use the tasting wheel. You can come up with whatever comes up for you in terms of uh, flavors or even like sometimes people say this reminds me of like hot chocolate as a kid or a walk in the park or whatever right so use whatever you want to use if it's evocative in that way for you please feel free to put it in the chat um and so terminology i was going to say astringent so alan mentioned astringency i think we know what bitterness is keep in mind bitter and sour are different bitter is more for quick hand like more on the burnt side um those kinds of flavors sour um, is more bright fruit, acidic, lemon, those sorts of things. Astringency is what happens when you, for those in California, eat a persimmon that's not ripe and it dries out your mouth. It's horribly astringent. Um, so astringency is also a feature in chocolate and it can be a, a nice balance or it could be excessive. So keep that in mind as you're tasting. Um, and try not to look at the front of the bar if you are somebody who knows chocolate so that you keep a pure open mind and you're just tasting it with a beginner's mind and just really tasting what the flavors are. And, and okay, I'm talking a lot now, um, notice how it melts, what the texture is like, how does it feel? Um, the way Seneca described how he tests when something is the right um, particle size is he lets it melt and then pushes with his tongue up on his palate to see, can you feel any of the little bits? Um, that's also, you know, we're looking at European style chocolate right now. So that's one of the things we would be looking at and assessing is that the, the texture. So notice that as you're tasting as well. And then at the end, when you're done, how does your mouth feel? What does it taste like? Take a little sip of water, taste B, and then maybe repeat if you can, as Alan, as Alan tells us a little bit more about Camino Verde. Is it okay to yes. put you on the spot there with that? Sure, yeah. Okay. And and just give me one second here because I'm looking up something that, that I think sure. would be interesting. So for those of you already tasting, if you 
like I get really nice um, aroma after having snapped it. You're welcome to put it in the chat if you feel like it has a lovely smell and maybe compare A to B, what you're noticing, or just write it on your card. I mean, you don't have to contribute to everybody and be super public about it, but you're welcome to. Okay, I am ready. Let's see here. Let me get it back up. All right. So, so the last time I tasted chocolate made with Camino uh, Verde was uh, actually a long time ago. So I don't have too many very clear memories. I know it's from Ecuador, and that immediately makes me think um, a couple of possibilities. So, so first of all, I want to mention some of you may have heard this is very common to this day. People talk about it this way that there are three types of cacao. That there's Criollo, that there's Forastero, and there's Trinitario. And I really think we should stop talking about it like this um, because it is absolutely in inaccurate. Forastero does not, uh, Forastero covers so many quote unquote varieties of cacao that the genetic variation between everything within Forastero is much larger than say the distance or you know, much greater than say the distance between Criollo and some of the quote unquote Forastero cacaos. So really what, what you wanna to try to remember is there are many, many varieties um, in terms of genetic clusters, there are 11 that we know of right now, there could be more. And so you could think of it uh, in a very real sense of there being 11 base varieties from which others can be made by breeding, which humans are very good at doing and have been doing for hundreds of years, thousands of years perhaps. So we have clones as well that have been developed by various organizations. So cacao is all over the map. And so I say this because you will often read or hear that cacao in Ecuador is nacional. It's nacional cacao. Well, nacional is one of those genetic clusters it is guaranteed that the vast majority of cacao in Ecuador is not pure nacional by any stretch of the imagination. Um, is there pure nacional there still? I don't know, there could be. Is there pure nacional in places like uh, Peru or Bolivia, perhaps? Um, can we really say what nacional tastes like? I don't know. I have tasted some that was supposed to be quite pure, which was incredibly floral, the, the most floral uh, cacao I've ever tasted. This particular cacao has, is being called Neo Nacional. What that signifies, I have no idea. Um, but the, the tasting notes from the, um, from the company that is sourcing this cacao are listed. Should I say this yet, or is to should should? Well, we when you say people? when you say the company sourcing the cacao, you're talking about Camino Verde, their page because yeah, you don't know the brands of the makers. I didn't want to advertise for a company, so that's why I said the company sourcing the cacao. I'm not. Oh, okay. I'm not yeah. talking about Got it. the person doing the fermentation. You mentioned him already, I believe. R right, and you're not talking either about the makers. You're talking about the person who's importing and then distributing this cacao. Their flavor notes, yeah. Absolutely. They're listed as fudgy, almond, and floral. Now, fudgy and almond are quite generic and could be used for so many different chocolates. Floral, I, I find to be a much more specific uh, descriptor when it comes to chocolate. I, I actually don't taste a lot of floral characteristics in many chocolates. And when I do, it's surprising and extremely interesting to me. Um, could be related to a compound that's often mentioned called linalool, which is uh, terpene. Uh, and so I think if this really is a nacional, maybe you will taste some floral characteristics. Uh, it does say here, which I find incredibly interesting, that Vicente, who's doing, who's the owner of Camino Verde, um, is uh, he's using a multitude of inoculated ferments and added enzymes, which I had never heard of. It, I mean, it makes total sense to me why someone would experiment with that, but I hadn't heard of people adding enzymes 
Um, adding ferments, yes, like adding a mother, for example, uh, yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. But um, I, I find that interesting. And you could certainly alter, I mean, everyone knows who's into brewing, how important the yeast strain is for the, the flavor profile of the beer. And so you could think of the same thing for cacao. Now, of course, that would still be part of the origin characteristic, even if it's not you know, inherent to the cacao genes themselves. Um, you get the cacao from origin, whatever it already has in terms of flavor compounds, origin characteristics. And so, you, so those could vary considerably based upon the yeast, and I have talked for a very long time and will now stop, but th those are my thoughts. Thank you, yes, and it's true that uh, Vicente, I mean, so I've been, I've been sort of paused on chocolate for a couple of years now, but when Vicente originally came out with this cacao, I know he was selling lots that were like lot A, lot B, lot C, and they were very, they were fermented in different ways and perhaps even sorted, and actually we have somebody on right now, Susan Goodhue, who has been and visited this farm, um, so different lots were described in different, were different flavor characteristics. So I can't say, because it's not on the bars um, of these two different makers, which lot they were using. And I'm not sure he's even still doing that, but I just want to throw that out there for, for you all to get a sense. And at the time when he first came out with this cacao, this was like unheard of. It was just not being done. He was like the guy who had like some kind of food science chemistry degree, doctorate in one of these degrees and was really getting geeky about how to ferment, how to even sort by phenotype, I believe. So they were sorting the cacao and then trying to do these batch ferments. Um, but without going on too much about A and B because we have more chocolate to taste, um, people have written stuff there about stuff. Uh, so B tasting familiar, maybe having a smoother texture, but A has a more variety of flavors. Um, you all have been just keeping your own thoughts to yourself other than the folks who, okay, right, thanks. So Vicente stopped doing lots of this after the earthquake and is rebuilding. Um, yes, so does anyone want to say anything about the A or B in, in the chat? Like say if they loved one over the other, are you surprised that they're the same origin? Did they feel like there was some similarities? Do they feel very different? Feel free to write that if you want, or we can also just keep that to ourselves. <laughs> I don't want to pressure anyone to participate. Um, as that both seem to have a sour, maybe herbal finish. Yeah, I definitely felt that with B, there was something pretty intense at the end that was like not pleasant to me. I'm pretty sensitive to bitter. And by that, I mean, like, I love to eat bitter vegetables and endive and all kinds of stuff that are really bitter greens, but um, not a fan of it in chocolate. And there was something quite uh, intense at the end for B, for me, um, and a little earlier on for me uh, in A. Oh my gosh, I forgot to introduce that Carla was here. Carla is here of Crew Chocolate. Um, and she says, very dry finish on B. And I would agree on that. So sometimes that astringency, that intense astringency, your mouth feels very dry. Um, it does seem to me that there's quite a bit of um, tasted A and fruity for A, caramel for B, both had a sour finish and B had a bitter finish, yes. Oh my gosh, everyone's now writing now that I'm <laughs> going on to C and D. This is great, everybody check it out. We've got a lot of folks saying different things about prune, raisin, raspberry, different flavors. Um, Estelle felt they were both quite astringent. She liked B over A because it was more rounded um, and that she liked, she would probably pair them with citrus. Um, yeah, so it's great that you're noticing the texture as well. A was very bitter to you, Carla, and the texture of B was smoother, I agree. And so when I reveal the bars, we'll also get to see what are the ingredients, because some of the makers do two ingredient bars, which means just cacao and sugar, and others are adding extra cocoa butter. So that might also help explain the different textural components. So we're gonna taste C and D. Well, let's just start with C actually. Um, no, let's do C and D, why not? Um, Go ahead and do it the same way. And actually, I'm trying to think if there's something I could have Alan talk to us about. Maybe actually, um, I have something yeah. to add already. If you don't Go mind. for it. Yes, please. Um, so it, a lot of people are mentioning bitterness and astringency. And this is one of the things that uh, I looked at for my research uh, with consumers. And so when I say I looked at it, what do I mean? There are several different origins. Ghana, Peru, Madagascar, um, they were all treated the same way. And we found that there was no difference in origin in, in what I'm about to tell you. And that is that the darker the roast was, 
the consumers perceived it to be less bitter and less astringent. So darker the roast, less bitter, less astringent. And that is both for the high temperature, low time, and the lower temperature, longer time. Mm. So bitter was raw, was always more bitter, always more astringent. And so keep this in mind when you're comparing chocolates and you're thinking, wow, these have some amazing fruit notes and it seems so fresh and bright, but it's so acidic that like, I wanna scrape my tongue off. There's a reason for that. And it has to do with the roast that has been chosen by the chocolate maker. That's very helpful. Um, are y'all tasting C right now? It's quite a bit different, isn't it? It feels a lot gentler. Notice the texture of that too, how it melts, the flavors. And actually if you bite, I just bit into a tiny piece of it. And um, I get some crunchiness, seems to me, I wish Alan had these chocolates to taste. Seems to me a bit of sugar, you know, sugar that's not completely, um, I hate to comment on chocolate and how it's made because I'm not a chocolate maker, but it does seem to me, hey, any chocolate makers on? I know there are some, do you guys notice? And gals um, notice, um, is that sugar? Help me out here, Taylor. Seneca, Carla. I couldn't say for sure what the particles are, but there's definitely technical issues. <laughs> uh, I would agree. I'm not sure I, I can, unless it's really bad. I'm not sure I can tell the difference between nibs and sugar at that size. If it's just a, a textural issue, I'm not sure I can tell the difference. Mm. I guess I assumed it was sugar because it feels like it isn't gritty and staying, it kind of eventually melts, which nibs, like little bits of cacao wouldn't necessarily, if it wasn't small enough, melt away, but sugar will, right? Again, not a maker. <laughs> um, I get uh, anise and licorice, some folks are saying, tobacco and flavor, uh, tobacco flavor in C. Um, Deanna does not like this bar, um, grainy, chalky tobacco and licorice. Mm -hmm. So licorice sounds nice unless you hate licorice. Uh, tobacco potentially too, but chalky and grainy, I'm, I don't know. I don't think that's ever very yum yum for most folks. Um, Which is the highest rating you can give a bar? Yum yum. Yum yum? No. <laughs> um, all right. Tobacco, don't like the texture of C. All right. So some folks have moved on to D, I see. So I'm let's jealous. check out- I want to taste all these chocolates. <laughs> so bummed. Um, Estelle is agreeing with Deanna about that. So let's try D. This one's a much thicker bar, maybe hard to snap. You might need to like either bite into it or get a knife if you want to break it into pieces. It's a tricky thing about bars. They're all different shapes and sizes and thicknesses and all of it. Um, so, Let's go ahead with D and then Alan, you, you see the chat and stuff, right? So feel free yes. to chime yeah. in, um, anyone who, if you wanna chime in. Quick question this is gonna before. Be, yes, please. Quick question, this is the same bar? C and D? Or is this already the same bean? No, no. Only A and B were the same origin. C and D are different. Gosh, coconut, it's, I, I, I just was smelling and thinking coconut, but my eyes are also seeing Amanda's comment about D equals coconut flavor, even just on the nose here. It smells yeah, like I'm coconut really as Carla that. says, yep. Yeah. These for delicious, the coconut that I love. Alan's gonna sing while we all taste without him. <laughs> You're such a good sport. Mm, Estelle is making a guess, I love it. She's saying Ghana, a bokfa particular spot from Ghana. Interesting. I'm not going to reveal yet. We'll reveal later. I will say that I do sometimes get some pretty clear uh, coconut and Ghanaian cacao, but I've also gotten it in, uh, for example, when I was getting ready to start Patrick chocolate, I went through and tasted everything I could possibly find that I thought might be good chocolate. And I remember there's a hot chest. Is that, where's uh -huh. that from? Is it Germany? Germany? Yeah, German. Yeah. It was an Ecuador bar and it was so coconutty. It was ridiculous coconut. It wasn't good chocolate though, but, uh, but it tastes a lot like coconut. And I do love coconut. It's just that otherwise it wasn't a good bar. Mm -hmm. I found that about a lot of Ecuador's. I was, it was one of the words I would use was like green and coconut, but not in a good way, even though I like coconut. Yeah. Um, more coconut comments. 
uh, Carla was saying added cocoa ball, add, add the feel, it feels like added cocoa butter from the melt. Um, yeah, everyone's saying high cocoa butter, uh, smooth, almost oily texture. This is an interesting point. Deanna says she prefers a thinner bar, right? So it's interesting to notice what people's preferences are. Some folks really like a nice thick bar. It's like satisfying and meaty in a sense. Other folks like thinner bars. Um, and of course, makers choose the, the kind of thinner thickness that they like because, hey, they're making it, so they should do that. Um, so there's nothing, I mean, there shouldn't be anything added to this bar in terms of coconut, right? So this is just a plain dark chocolate um, with the ingredients permitted in dark chocolate that, I mean, that's a bigger story, but here for today's purposes, cacao, sugar, cocoa butter. Um, in these bars, there's no added vanilla. Yes, folks are really mentioning slippery melt. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like interesting things, a lot of comments on texture, not sure that you necessarily like a slippery melt. I mean, slippery melt could be a positive, I'm not sure. Um, some folks are saying it feels almost like an oily texture. I'm assuming that's maybe not something you're partial to. Um, but yeah, very different from the previous one, right? A cooling melt, so it definitely has outed cocoa butter, yeah. Um, all right, well, I say yeah, just to uh, uh, like agree with you, but I'm trying not to reveal anything yet. So we're gonna taste two last bars before I do the reveal. These ones are have inclusions in them, so that means that it's not just plain cacao. Um, so an inclusion could mean that it is um, a milk with just a milk or, with, or milk with flavors, um, or not a milk, but with other sort of flavors. So let's go ahead with E and see what you think um, of E. <laughs> Folks are saying about the last bar that like, a couple people have said very almond joy. So that's interesting, right? Because for a lot of folks, that is like a really wonderful childhood experience, right? And so you could really be loving this bar because it's eliciting that in you that it really reminds you of some childhood experience with, or adult, obviously adult experience too with Almond Joys, but sometimes they're the more um, compelling experiences tend to run back to childhood. Um, yes, so this one is very soft, the, um, the E, good, good noticing. Do you get anything on the nose before you taste it? Interesting. People are saying ginger and lemongrass, mm -hmm. which Look. together are two of my favorite inclusions for chocolate. So folks saying gingerish, lemongrass, citrus was first reaction. Someone said key lime pie, lime, lemongrass. So lots of lots of comments and also noticing the texture. Um, Deanna saying quick melt, but soggy. Not sure she really likes the texture. I'm not going to say, but I don't know what to say about the texture because I'm actually in a very hot environment right now, so it's not ideal for noticing yeah. the texture. Peggy, I think she is indeed saying that unless the ingredients are incorrect, there was no coconut flavor or coconut added to that chocolate for D. Yes, absolutely. For D, that's the case. Um, the coconut flavor is just from the cacao. Just like what we were saying in the earlier bars, um, other flavors like tobacco and anise and licorice, none of that is like anything added to the bar. It's just native to the cacao. Um, powdered sugar lemon cookie flavor. Oh, <laughs> that's so evocative. Warm spice overtones. Someone was thinking of lemon crinkle cookies for E. Cardamom, or maybe love the ginger and lemongrass, a bit too sweet. Okay, good. Um, great noticing. That one is definitely eliciting a lot of comments. Dessert. <laughs> Uh, some folks have moved on to F. Let's get on to F because I want to make sure we don't go too far over time and have space for questions. Um, let's go with the F, Nabisco Lemon Coolers. I love it. I don't know what a Nabisco Lemon Cooler is. Didn't grow up it's with that. but So precise, Nabisco Lemon Cooler. What is the <laughs> expiration date on those coolers? Is that, that a joke? joke. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, someone's saying it evolves lemongrass to lime to almost jasmine. Um, the F, I forgot to have a little taste of water here. Beef jerky for F, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Alan's really wondering what, what we're tasting here. Um, I am. I, is this whole thing just to mess with me? <laughs> I never sent you any bars. <laughs> just gaslighting you. Um, Mm. So we have a kid. I get it. I get what you're saying about beef jerky. 
I had never gotten that before in tasting this bar, but I get it. It's interesting too, because every time I've tasted this bar has not been right after E. And what you taste right before can really impact what you're tasting next. F tastes like, so smoky, savory touch is what people are pointing to. Yeah, so there's the beef jerky point. I totally get it. Oh my gosh, now this bar is beef jerky to me. Um, dark gingerbread, cloves, <laughs> peppered. Old cheese. <laughs> Mushroom and old cheese. Okay, some umami and maybe not in the best way for a chocolate bar. Saigon cinnamon. I mean, I suppose if your chocolate's gonna taste like cheese, you do want it to be old cheese. Yes, true. Old, delicious, stinky cheese. Yeah. Nutmeg, cardamom, spicy pepper finish, grainy. Someone's pointing out, again, the texture here. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think this far when I was breaking it, well, depends on the piece you got, but the mold on the back when I was opening up the bars was like not, not flat. Usually bars are flat unless they have active inclusions. Grainy texture, savory cardamom pepper, my tongue hurts. It is, it is a lot of chocolate too, Deanna. I know your tongue, you're, you're, you're very sensitive. Um, heat, someone's getting heat. Is anyone else feeling the fatigue like of so many flavors and but so much focus? Floral teriyaki with pink or white pepper. <laughs> Alan, I bet you're wishing you could taste this. Um, okay, the mold seems to make it easy to have bubbles. Um, well, so shall I reveal to everybody what is what? I'm gonna quickly just screen share with you and then show you the different bars. Is one of them beef jerky? <laughs> no? Yeah, I basically <laughs> didn't tell people that I was sending meat. Um, that would be very uncool. Where is my, mm. give me one second. Oh, I see why, okay. Floral teriyaki with pink pepper. Floral teriyaki with pink pepper is really kind of fascinating. All right, here we go. Can you all see the screen? Give me a verbal yes, Alan. It's loading. I could, but it's, oh, it's okay, loading. It's coming, it's okay. coming. Okay, all right, yes. so here we go. The reveal, y'all ready? Um, a. So Ritual Chocolate, classic maker. So what I've tried to put in here is just a few points, right? So how long has this maker been making chocolate? Um, the first point is where they're located. The second point is when they were established, the names of the folks, um, where their cacao's from, and then ingredients. If it's three ingredients for a dark chocolate, I'm pointing to added cocoa butter. So cacao, sugar, and added cocoa butter. And then for each of these bars, I was able to find the actual maker tasting notes that they put on their bar. So um, the first bar is the Ritual Chocolate Camino Verde 75. Maybe some of you recognize that. Um, I can't, well, actually I can. I can pop in and see what y'all are saying at the same time. Okay. Um, the next bar, I'm trying to go through quickly and then leave you time to, 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 um, to ask questions. Uh, Crow and Moss, so maker out of Michigan, uh, recently established, so 2019, Mike Davies. This is the second Camino Verde bar. This bar is two ingredients. And then the tasting notes, you notice fudge, almond, and black tea. I'm just gonna go back for a sec because I didn't read the actual notes. Cracker, honey, and fudge was what Ritual said, right? So we do have some overlap between the two makers. Fudge, almond, and black tea for this particular bar. For me, sometimes like there's ways, I don't know, Alan, I used to feel this way when I was seeing people's tasting notes. Sometimes there's like really nice ways to say that something tastes not so great. Um, and like, I remember Colin, I'm gonna throw Colin under the bus here just for a second. I love Colin. Um, he referred to walnut in a particular bar. And I remember that bar to me felt super astringent, like kind of like, the flavor of the skin of a walnut. Like that's mm. sometimes why people hate walnuts like Seneca Classen because of that sort of flavor, right? So to me, black tea kind of points to astringency a little bit. And I think that we did find that this bar had some astringency to it. Like an oversteeped black tea is what I think of. Mm -hmm. um, so this one was two ingredient versus the ritual that was three ingredient. Um, I'm gonna keep moving just to, to interest of time. So C um, was sole cacao. So the, 
Maloney Brothers out of uh, Bronx, established in 2015. This is a classic cacao. Alan used to make chocolate with this. A lot of makers uh, use Madagascar. It's kind of a classic, very bright, fruity, juicy, citrusy berries kind of bar. Um, this one is two ingredient. You can check back on your notes that you made um, to see. And um, the tasting notes here, raisins, red plum, and red wine notes. D was the last of the plain darks that we tasted. And some of you may have guessed. Oh, sorry, hold on one sec. Are we, oops. Ah. D was chocolat bonin, so a classic maker, very classic European style. So definitely three ingredients. And I would say a lot of the third ingredient. So very high cocoa butter content. That's what some of you are pointing to in terms of the oily feel, very slippery texture. Um, established since forever, like puts every other chocolate maker, like makes us all look like we're just little children running around trying to make chocolate. I mean, I don't really mean that, but you know what I mean. Established in 1884. So generations worth of chocolate making and confectionery. Stéphane Bonat currently at the helm. Côte d'Ivoire, there was nothing more specific than that. Côte d'Ivoire, there wasn't anything more in terms of where the cacao came from. And uh, I kind of love the, the, the notes, the tasting notes. Classique, léger, and parfumé. I left them in French just because, mm -hmm. why not? So there's, mm -hmm. interesting, the only thing there that actually points to anything flavor-wise is the parfumé, right? And the lightness of it, certainly light, I would agree. I mean often cocoa buttery bars are. And classique, it's like, that's true too, right? This is Ivory Coast and Ghana, like this is this is chocolate as we know it or as we grew up with, right? This is like the classic, um, often bulk commodity cacao, really fudgy chocolatey kind of notes. Um, so that was D. And then... And I, I will say really yes. quickly that Bona is known for using a very heavy hand with the roasting. Um, so I didn't actually taste this. So I can't say for sure that that's still the case, but um, I would be surprised if it has changed. So if you're thinking, was this a dark roast? The answer is probably yes. Okay, yeah, interesting. That was the one that everyone was pointing to coconut, getting a lot of flavor of coconut, which is especially interesting as you're all pointing to coconut in the plain chocolate, because the next bar that we had is actually called lime in the coconut. Um, meaning this is a bar that instead of adding dairy or milk to it, coconut was added. So it's in a sense of vegan milk. Um, and then there's also essential uh, lime essential oil added to this. So this is one of the playful, so Seneca was pointing to a second brand that he started called Onomea, pointing to these sort of more playful confectionery kind of like fancy candy bars that he developed during COVID. So um, that was the second to last bar. And that texture, a lot of you pointing to saying, um, I think one of the words was uh, soggy and not sure they love the texture mm -hmm. or whatever. So you could talk to that, Alan, in terms of like, I mean, coconut is a different beast, right? It's got a lot of fat in it. And so it's gonna definitely alter the, the flavor and texture uh, of the chocolate. Yeah, so, so if, yeah, if you are, if you are anticipating that the only fat in a chocolate bar is cocoa butter, um, and then you taste this and it, it melts quickly. And um, yeah, I don't remember the other words that people used, but um, you might think, oh, there's extra cocoa butter. But in this case, coconut fat melts at a lower temperature. And when you combine it with cocoa butter, uh, I wanna say that the temperature is actually even a bit lower. So depending upon, the amount of coconut fat, which is dependent upon the amount of coconut that's been used, you could get something that really melts extremely readily on the tongue, which some people love and some people don't love as much. I think I tend to like it overall, but when you know what it is that's causing the sensation, I think psychologically it might be more pleasant. So knowing that this is lime in the coconut people might say like, oh yeah, got it. Right, right, totally makes sense. And sorry, Seneca, for putting you on the spot. I mean, no other makers who we tasted today are here. So you get to get the feedback in the raw. Um, I put established 2021, of course, in a sense, like that is the established time of the brand, but it's also 
um, being done by a maker who's been making for many years. Um, so based in Honolulu, cacao from Oahu. So these are all still all Hawaiian bars in terms of the cacao being from one of the islands. This is from Oahu. Um, and there is cocoa butter added as well. And then the maker notes are kind of funny. This is a more playful uh, Hawaiian style bar. And so the maker notes I found on the website was shake it all up, island flavor for days. <laughs> um, next bar, last bar was Sibo chocolate their chai chocolate bar. So Cibo chocolate is based in Costa Rica using cacao from the Southern Pacific region of Costa Rica. Um, established a long time ago, 2007, this was a, a, a desire to try to create a business with purpose. Um, one where the value add is ha actually happening where the cocoa grows, which is very unusual. Um, and this one has a lot of you are pulling out a lot of spices. Uh, beef jerky is not in here, but yes, so on cinnamon, um, Black pepper, allspice, ginger, cardamom, cloves, and nutmeg. Um, and then on a base of milk chocolate, unfortunately, my bar wrappers are at home and um, I couldn't, I didn't remember to write down the milk chocolate and it was very hard online to find a picture of the back of the bar or even the list of the milk chocolate. So I just put this milk chocolate there. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing because I want to get back to your faces and I can't see what any of you are doing or thinking and I can't see the chat. And Sunita, um, they're asking, yes. uh, someone was asking where they can be purchased and Seneca did answer for himself. But I think when we discussed it, the idea was that all of these chocolate makers have websites and most of them either sell direct or if they don't, you know, in the case of Bana from France, they may not ship directly to the US, but they certainly um, should be able to suggest where you can find their bars in the United States. Um, and Bona is, is not generally hard to find in the US, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, so I guess, yes, I wanna point you all to direct to the makers, you can buy these bars. Um, and just to make the point of the Onomea, so uh, Jessica really loved that bar. There are four different flavors in their lineup currently. So there's this one that you tasted, there's macadamia, not nuts and salt. There's uh, matcha crunch, which has puff quinoa and is a milk. And then the last one is? Pog. Oh, maybe I'm screwing up. It's not. I can't remember which is milk and which is not. Yes, it is milk. Pog is the passion orange guava. So there's four different flavors. Um, and yes, the dark nibs we tasted are those used for the Onomea bar. Um, for Bona, just to be thorough, uh, and Cibo, because that you might want to not order from Costa Rica, those can be found on Chocosphere. So Chocosphere sells both Bona, all types of different origins, as well as the Cibo. Um, now, let me just take a pause for a moment because it's 3.15 and I do see your question, Carla. Um, I wanna leave a little time for more Q and A and oh, I'm so sorry that your chocolates arrived on a very hot day and some melted and this is gonna be an issue. This is Jen. Um, this is gonna be an issue going forward. We're gonna have to change the packaging obviously and include insulation and, and ice packs, uh, which just makes everything a little more complicated and sketchy, especially when you have delivery companies that are so sketchy and not always accomplishing what they need to. It does affect the, I'm gonna let Alan answer this because the question is since they hardened back up after melting, yes, they have lost their temper. It's gonna be a very different experience um, in terms of how it melts and the flavors um, unfold. Thank you, Estelle. We'll get to you in one second, Alan, to go deeper into that and the other question that Carla had. Um, you can get uh, similarly flavored bars from an Austin maker called Madhu. So you could check them out. You wanna jot that down, M-A-D-H-U. Um, different like Indian spices and you know, chai, I guess is, is typically an, traditionally an Indian um, set of flavors, although there's all kinds of variations of it. Um, before I keep you a little bit longer and we answer those questions, I just wanted to, oh, I forgot the last slide. I'm such a dork. Um, let me do this again real quick. The last thing was to tell you that if you want to, we will be doing another one uh, next month. I already have the date. I didn't ask Alan actually, so hopefully this date works for you. March 26th, Saturday, same time. Um, Alan will have, the, I think, will have the chocolates this time. Um, and I thought we could do a deep dive on cocoa butter. It did come up a bit, the coconut adding to a bar also came up, like just the idea of fats and chocolate and how that changes things. Is it a bad thing to add cocoa butter? Is it a good thing? Does it make it better? Like all of those kinds of things is what we will go over. Um, and so just logistically order by the end of the month is generally gonna be the rule and we will ship priority mail the week of the 14th. Um, 
And if your box does not get to you by 325, that's 11 days. Um, I'm, I'm betting on USPS to, to come through. The next month's box is, box is on me. Um, okay, so those are the logistics. The link is live if you want. Oh, I should put it in the chat. I will do that. But first I'm gonna ask Alan. Oh, there's a lot more questions coming in here. Um, thank you, Max, for putting in Madhu Chocolate's link. <laughs> My next two boxes are on Sunita Allen. Yeah, the first two were too. <laughs> um, anyway, so Alan, if you want to point to that question about tempering, as well as Carla's question about the butyric acid note on the last bar, the Cebu chocolate, um, what does it have to do? Might, might it have something to do with how they treat the milk in the bar? Like classically, the butyric acid is what we taste in Hershey's Kisses, like the milk, the soured milk sort of flavor. So I'm going to let you answer that. But before we do that, I just want to let anyone know that who, if you don't already know, you're allowed to leave when you want. Um, but we will continue for a little bit longer and answer these questions. Um, and please shoot me an email um, if you uh, have any questions or concerns. And I will put into the link in a moment, as Alan is talking, the link to um, Next month, next month's box. If you want to click on that and just open a tab in your on your computer, go ahead, Alan. Okay. Uh, so the good news is that even if my chocolate for next month doesn't arrive, I'll have the chocolate from this month to taste. So, <laughs> uh, does the butyric acid note on the last one have to do with how they treat the milk? So it's unlikely that craft chocolate maker is processing their milk themselves. You know, I know that sometimes. Uh, people have toasted their milk powder, but generally they're using spray dried milk powder, not necessarily roller dried, though that also exists. Um, as Sunita said, Hershey's is known for having a somewhat off flavor to their milk that Europeans despise, which is said to be because of butyric acid, which smells a lot like vomit. Um, and someone did spill some in my lab once, and it really doesn't smell good. Uh, you don't really want to taste it in chocolate. On the other hand, I mean, everything has a threshold, right? Like, so if you were like right at that butyric acid threshold, there's a chance that somehow it could work with chocolate. Um, but I don't think the craft chocolate maker probably processed their milk powder or their milk to, to make it have any butyric character. And so if it does, it's either from the cacao which I suppose could be possible from over fermentation or one of the inclusions. That is my answer there. What else do we have? Um, oh, the so Melting. yes, once, once chocolate is melted uh, and then hardened back up, it's not tempered. What that means is that the crisp, so essentially a chocolate bar that is well tempered is one giant crystal. Essentially, you can cleave that one giant crystal. When it melts and recrystallizes, it will not be one giant crystal anymore. It will be many, many, many more crystals. It's been an uncontrolled crystallization process. And it does impact the way flavor comes across. It impacts the mouthfeel. Um, it doesn't make the chocolate dangerous to eat in any way, uh, but it's not ideal, you could say. And so to, to answer the question, yes, it will affect the taste. Of course, it won't make a Madagascar bar taste like a bar from Ecuador, but it won't taste exactly the same as it did uh, when it was tempered. Mm -hmm. um, what can we infer about the roasting profile from the bars we tasted? Luca. That's a tough question for Alan since he didn't taste the bars. Still try, try. <laughs> um, Luca, Luca. You can assume that they from are what? roasted. <laughs> yes. Let's assume they have actually been made from cacao that was roasted. Uh, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think Lucas is giving me a hard time at this point. So maybe Sunita has something to say there or Seneca or another chocolate maker. Yeah, I think the, the chocolate makers could chime in if they feel like it in, in terms of what they may have noticed and their experience working with some of these similar origins if they have. Um, I'll just add, one thing that I've now forgotten I wanted to add is yes, this is a beta, we're doing a beta of three months. So Alan and I, just to give you background, Alan and I 
decided to do this together for three months and see how it works and how we feel and how we like it and how y'all like it. And so part of how y'all like it, we need to know. So, well, you don't have to tell us, but if you want to put anything in the chat or shoot me an email and give me feedback or say like, you know, one of the questions Alan had was like, was it good value? That would be something you could ask. Did you enjoy yourself? Did you learn a lot? Was, um, you know, whatever it is you'd like to give us feedback on, is it enjoyable? Is it a way you want to spend your Saturday afternoon? Um, keeping in mind, recordings are always available if you do miss the tasting. So if you want to give us that feedback, that would be great. Um, and I think that's the only last thing I wanted to say. So please feel free to let us know if any of the makers who are on here, who you're glad you missed the vomit. Yes. <laughs> yes, you are. Um, if any of the makers want to chime in, I know, I don't know how you feel about it. Um, if you had any thoughts as you were tasting it. And if you do think that way, as you're tasting, like this feels like a very, you know, long and whatever dark roast as you were tasting if any of that came up for you um you're welcome to chime in i do remember we had another question um from much earlier that was a question from kurt about i'm just going from memory here that doing it at altitude how that impacts things um i need to scroll up a bunch because steve devries was roasting in colorado and um and so that was one of the questions was how the altitude might affect the uh the roast i should have cut and paste that at that time and copied it because i'm does that is that an adequate question for you um alan or kurt if you want to unmute and just say what you wanted to say out loud that would be welcome too oh roasting the roasting at altitude is that yeah, so that... you so you said that you'd get flavor development at two th can you hear me yes. yes okay you said you get flavor development at 213 or, or basically over the boiling point so if you drop the boiling point at altitude, so DeVries and I are at the same elevation because he's only 30 miles away, um, you're boiling at about 203, would you then get flavor development at altitude at 204 or when the water starts to evaporate and the caramelization can occur? So, so what I would say is without doing an experiment, I can't be certain, but if I'm gonna guess, uh, I'm gonna say that you know, the boiling point is depressed for all volatile compounds. So you're going to lose more of all of them at that lower temperature, including water. Um, and, and so that means that, yes, you are most likely going to start to get some flavor development at that slightly lower temperature. Of course, it's going to also be temperature dependent because those, you know, mired reactions, uh, they do depend on the amount of heat that's being dumped into the system, not just how much moisture is there. Uh, but, but yeah, I think you are correct in thinking that there could be a difference. Cool, thanks. And then a very, very important question has come through and it's definitely on my mind and it's like scheming and I forget the other word, sort of just on the back burner here. Brian asks question with, the, will this three months didn't end with a surprise reopening in the Patrick Webb store because he's out of blood orange and cream and unhappy and needs happy chocolate. So, um, I, so I have been asking Alan and the first time I asked him a question about um, chocolate and his factory and what the situation was, he, he was like, no, I have no Wi-Fi there. I have no whatever. I can't show you anything in, in process or whatever. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not why I'm asking. Like, I'm just wondering if there's just even a remote possibility that you would make some chocolate again. And if we could convince you to make some chocolate. And so uh, the answer to your question, Brian, is that um, it wasn't a no, it wasn't a flat out no. So I have a lot of hope that there may be a way to um, get Alan to work on some special projects. Like I mentioned, you know, um, the idea at some point we were working on, we being like, I was asking him to do this so that I could buy it and sell it. That's the work I did. Um, asking him to do like a Janduya egg, like a special Janduya Easter egg, which of course, if Alan made it would be amazing. And so he was working on it and there were just different issues that, he, that were, that were coming up. And in the end that never got launched, but things like that, I think, um, yes, Christina needs the oatmeal cookie. Yes. I know that's like, when I think of oatmeal cookie, I think of you, Christina, <laughs> favorite bar. There is a possibility that Ellen will do some of these, could be convinced. And so I'm glad you all, everyone's bringing up their favorite bar now, brown butter, oatmeal cookie. <laughs> I want habanero 67, the plain Madagascar with habanero sea salt. That was like fantastic. Um, the boss, of course, cause that's the best with tequila. So um, there's hope, I guess, is the short answer. And Luca's got his alcohol there that he's showing us that he's pairing, <laughs> pairing with chocolate. Um, 
there was a oh, mocha bar. Yeah. Does anyone remember the cappuccino OMG that Alan made a million years ago? It was a mm. white, it was a white chocolate because cappuccino doesn't have chocolate in it. So it was a white chocolate bar. Um, that was, that was really delicious. Um, I feel like there was one more question that I kind of blew off because I was, oh yes. Has freeze drying been tried to remove the water? I don't know if it's been tried, but so this is one of the things when I was doing a little bit of reading for this event, just to come up with some interesting anecdote. Um, I would like to read something um, if you don't mind. Oh, don't tell me I closed it. So should not have closed it. Um, so he here's, here's what I'll do. I'll read this first thing here. So is it good to have a little more moisture at the beginning of the roast or is it not good? You might think it's not good based upon what I've been saying. And if you think it's not good, then you would probably agree with this comment. Um, wow, I marked the page and yet, here we go. Before roasting, pre-drying is necessary to reduce water content to below 4%. And during roasting, the moisture level decreases to about 2%. In industrial roasters, this pre-drying takes place as a separate processing stage. If roasted without pre-drying, cocoa would generate a cooked flat aroma. As the formation of most flavor compounds is based on condensation or decomposition reactions, a surplus of moisture would hinder these reactions and furthermore evaporate volatile reaction products by steam distillation. So you would actually lose some of the things that you're producing. And so this claim in a very well-respected book is that you absolutely need to dry the cacao to some extent first, or you're going to cause yourself huge problems. But uh, I can also tell you, and this is from a very recent paper. It's not, this is not peer reviewed. So that that's one thing um, by uh, you know, a PhD who works at Bueller Bart, which does roasters. That's what they do. They're a roaster manufacturing company. Um, he says, on the other hand, that it is incredibly important to have some moisture at the beginning because that is when you'll get the most, and this is going to be very technical, technical, but don't worry so much about the term, the most amidori products which are the most important products for producing additional compounds during the Maillard reaction. So what that means is if the cacao is too dry at the beginning, these things don't get produced and therefore is, as reactants for producing other flavor compounds, those other flavor compounds also never get produced. So he's saying, no, 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 you need some moisture at the beginning. And so, you know, the question that I would ask is, how much are we talking about? In the book, he says you need to get it down to 4%. Usually uh, in dry cacao, we're talking 7% um, in the bag. It can get a little drier over time. So he's talking in the book about drying it a bit in the paper. He's not specifying the percent, but he's definitely saying, don't dry that cacao out all the way or else uh, you're basically throwing up a barrier to producing some of the flavors that you're trying to develop. So as with many things chocolate, and Sunita said this already, sometimes you can read two different things that seem to disagree, and yet they can be meshed together if you think about it just right. And if you really want to validate, more experiments need to be designed. Yeah, it's super interesting. It makes me think, um... Do they mention the origin and fermentation and handling of the cacao going into that? So what, what precursors might be there could affect it as well, yeah? Yeah, they, they do mention it in, uh, in, in the book in a different, well, in that part of the flavor development uh, section, but they're, he's not tying it into the roasting and drying specifically. But certainly, um, you know, anytime you're looking to develop Mired reaction products in anything, then you do need those, like you said, 
uh, flavor precursors. So in this case, you know, simple sugars, amino acids, peptides, things of that nature. And those in cacao are really only going to be there to any large degree after the fermentation. So certainly, um, as you're suggesting, hugely important to get that fermentation, you know, quote unquote, right um, prior to roasting. Any other questions for Alan as we uh, are wrapping up? Actually, I have a question for you all because I eat small amounts of chocolate I, and not just chocolate. Like I have tiny little scoops of ice cream as I go through a lot of ice cream, I do a little bit at a time. So for me, I felt like this was adequate for two people to eat. Did, did anyone, did everyone feel like that? I see Jim and Claire nodding. Um, is it enough the size in terms of what you got? Um, hopefully yes. Say no in the chat or direct to me if, okay, if it didn't feel that way. Cool. Sounds like it was okay and adequate size. I think it was um, nice because I was going to say I had a little bit left over. So once you reveal them all, I can kind of go back through and have a little taste after that too. It's nice. Good. Excellent. Right. Yeah. That's an interesting point. Christina was saying at first she thought it wouldn't be, but after doing the tasting, yes, it was fine. It's funny because if I'll show you like one of my letters here, this is the A, I have like this much left, like most of it plus another little piece. But, but again, I'm, I may be a little, I may be OVD'd on chocolate for the eight years that I had the chocolate garage open. I'm still recovering. Um, there was a question. Now I lost it. How's the consulting business going, Alan? That's a great question. Uh, the consulting business is going well. And here's where I'm going to, uh, I'm going to shout out. Kristen Nicoletti, who is uh, at the tasting right now. She's my online business manager who has really helped me. So when someone asked me for a proposal, I put together a proposal in Word. It, there are lots of technical words there. It's, there are lots of bullet points. It goes on for eight pages. And uh, then Kristen comes and helps me to make it actually something that a normal person could consume. And, uh, you know, she's been helping me to do this. And just yesterday, um, uh, I got a new contract for helping a cheesecake company. Don't want to name the name of the company, but uh, helping a cheesecake company with a sugar bloom issue. Um, so if you were wondering if chocolate's the only thing that can be subject to sugar bloom, the answer is no. Consulting's going well. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm delighted for Alan. If you if you track, so we didn't really do the the stump the Allen game. Uh, stump stump the Allen, stump Allen, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Too much chocolate, not enough lunch. Um, but one of the things that has always been fascinating to me about Alan is his curiosity and passion for all foods. And as much as like in a sense, I was saying to Seneca earlier today, like, isn't it great? Like Alan's gonna go geek out about cheesecake for like a bunch of time and like get like understand all of it. And, and I was like, this is so great that he's doing this consulting stuff. And, and Seneca's like, well, it's not great for us. <laughs> which is true but I guess you see I'm a real friend I was actually thinking about what's best for Alan and so to see him get to like go deep in all these Burn. <laughs> friend just, yeah Seneca is just thinking about eating Patrick chocolate and not what's best for Alan anyway so it's really cool to see because it's uh if you like I said if you go follow Alan on Instagram it's really incredible I I'm always astonished at the stuff that he's making from scratch I remember years ago I was complaining. I had like two kids and I was trying to, what I was talking about chicken broth. And he's like, you know, Sunita, it's really not that hard to make chicken broth. You can make really delicious chicken broth and it's not so hard. And I was so weighed down with everything like kids and business and just life was so hard. I was like, ah, oh, can't do chicken broth. It's so basic. Alan does like everything you could imagine from scratch. I remember visiting you in Missouri one year and you said, oh, uh, I was just working this morning on either sourcing or curing a particular type of hog that was acorn fed, like you had just received your piece of animal or whole animal. Do you remember this? And you were like, Berkshire hog? Is that possible? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, it was a Berkshire, Missouri raised Berkshire hog that I drove across the state to get. So, yeah. So anyway, I, I think it's fascinating. And even though we're sad that uh, we can't, thank you for putting his, thank you, Kristen, for putting his um, handle in there. Um, even though we're sad that we're not eating Patrick chocolate these days, 
there's hope that there could be future future chocolate just to throw back on the chocolate garage. There may be future chocolate coming out of Patrick chocolate. Um, but in any case, I think that this is really like a, a good use of Alan McClure is being able to go deep on all these various things and continue to maintain his curiosity and his enthusiasm and his wanting to understand how all these things work. So um, yes. And then, you know, maybe what's in it for us is that um, in addition, he may throw out some bars here and there if we can uh, manage to convince him to do that, do some special runs for us. Um, I will send out an email for the next tasting. And um, it will be on March 26th and I will send out an email uh, shortly and with the record, well, actually there'll be a newsletter as well as an email direct to you. I will send the recording out to any of you who had to leave early or couldn't come, which I guess you can't hear this right now, if that's you. Um, but I will send an email out and let you all know. And the deadline for ordering for March will be the end of February. Um, and yeah, we'll focus on cocoa butter. So I'll put together some kind of a thematic tasting where we'll get to really focus on um, it's hard not, I, I'm not going to do the same origin. It's hard to get a fully focused thing, but um, it'll, it'll be focused on cocoa butter and the science of it and how it impacts um, um, chocolate. So uh, I think, <laughs> thanks, Jen. Um, this is interesting and informative. Yes. We bit less sad about never finding out about the chocolate garage before it closed. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be some little things that come out that sort of are evocative of the, you know, the spirit of the chocolate garage. So everybody who came, thank you so much for coming and thank you for staying so long. It is so exciting to have um, so many veteran tasters as well and old customers, familiar faces, new customers, folks from all over who are curious and interested in chocolate blog, people who are blogging about it, people who do tastings themselves and are chocolate sommeliers. Having makers here, it's so fun to have you um, on board as well talking about whatever it is you did or didn't talk about. Um, actually, everybody talked of the chocolate makers. Um, so yes, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, well, see maybe some of you or all of you next time um, in March to do another tasting. Thank you, Alan, Hi, for being here. Yes. Thank you to Nita for leading everything. Ooh, yeah. No thanks to FedEx and USPS. I'll just end on that. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Ooh, there's a Stump Allen question here. Okay. Hey, I'm, I'm, is Seneca still there or not? Mm, he no, hopped off. Gone. All right. Uh, you can ask your question, Luca, if you want, because he's actually still here just behind the wall. Yeah, I don't know if I get I was curious because I have some. Uh, is this the, the light roast? Is in get in this bar? I can't read it. Can you make it? Can you read it? What the bar is? It's a big island dark. Big island dark is a light roast or dark roast? Big island? Mm -hmm. We only do big island in Lonohana. Yeah. Oh, so it's light. That's all, it is. all of Lonohana is light, yeah. as it turns out, yeah. because it's like looking for more of those subtleties and all the different flavors. Um, where Onomea is the one that's yeah. done in the darker way over yeah. longer periods of time because it's a more classic chocolatey, like confectionery it's kind only, of. Yeah, it's only like that right now. Like yeah. Right any other last questions since some folks have hung on here to see if there's any more juicy stuff? Or if you like smaller groups to be able to speak and you're all muted. So if you're trying to talk unmute, please. And you're still being recorded, so watch what you say. Just a reminder. No? All right, well, this was super fun. Thank you, everybody. And maybe see you next month. Hey, is Seneca still in the room? Oh, he's around, yeah, I can ask him something. No, Seneca, I was gonna tell you, when I was doing your he bar- He can't hear I, you, but I will tell him. <laughs> okay, I was doing your bar and it, I got the lemongrass, but which is really lime. Um, and that coconutty flavor. And then I said it was soggy, right? Cause I'm not used to sweet. I got, you moved me up into dark bars through the chocolate garage, right? But it's funny when I was putting my packages together. So there's still a bit left of each one for Diana to taste. The only one there's nothing left of is that one. Cause I just kept tasting it. Cause I wanted to figure it out, you know, to figure it out. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Everything yeah. else is gone. Everything else is still there, but it is, is gone. So she's going to not be happy about that. But you can tell her it was really delicious. <laughs> it, was, it was really fun to taste something very different from the Lona Hanas.
Right. And I think there's something about the coconut, Seneca, we're talking about your bar. I'm going to, I had you in my ears, but now you're not. Um, so we were talking, Deanna was just saying that she had said about your bar that it was like, there's something about it that was kind of soggy or whatever, like the texture was really different, but all of the, all of the other bars are, um, there's stuff left for her to share with Diana, but for the, for the lime and the coconut, it's gone. So I was going to say that it seems like the coconut milk and the lime together end up doing something additional that yeah. people were like lemongrass, this, that, right? Like, cause, cause yeah. yeah, there's something that's going on between, I don't, that's my theory that there's something that's going on there that brings a really interesting complexity. That's like, yeah. wait, what's going on there? I want to go back and taste it again and again. Right. Yeah. It was interesting to my taste buds. You know, I, I got my little super taster things going like, well, what's going on here? What is that? And why is it? Feel so that was kind of fun. So I looked at the package and I'm like, where's the rest of it gone. <laughs> it's all gone. It. I need one piece. I have to have a piece. She's, she's going to know there's something missing in the box. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But, that's a really fun bar, actually. It's it's also one that he didn't really expect. Like when you think of mac nuts and salt, it's like duh, you know, Hawaiian flavors, pog, passion and guava. That's a no-brainer. It's also milky yeah. and sweet. And and then um the matcha crunch is is also compelling. But the lime and the coconut is a surprising one that um it's kind of unusual because of the texture, and sometimes that's off-putting to some people, but um the fact mm -hmm. that there's the lime, that freshness, is it is it a Mandy Aftel lime? Yeah. Yeah. So it's Mandy Aftel essential oil, which is like, you know, you can't go wrong with any of her essential oils. They're so good. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something really like surprisingly staple about that bar. It's been doing really well, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's the third out of four. It doesn't sell as well as the, you know, as Pog or Salted Magna. Mm. But it, uh, I think people become fond of it. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. a surprising it's really bar. Yeah, that is very really surprising. So it was it was good. And whatever happened to Madre chocolate, the one that had the uh, um, passion fruit bar that had the little pieces of oh, that was so good. Whatever happened to them? Are they still making chocolate? Well, yes and no. So they were uh, two folks. There were two folks who were running that, and um, they they. I guess what you do in a business when you don't want to work together anymore is you get a business divorce. So they split up um, yeah. and they stopped working together. And um, Dave went off and was doing other things. And Nat, who was the other co-founder has continued to make chocolate, but it's hard, like, and it's still called Madre, but it's not, I don't know. I guess I would say that it's not, it's not anything. It's not it, in the essential ways. It's missing what was there when the two of them were working together. That's a, that's a nice way of saying um, something that's way more complicated than that. And you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the recording. Oh, good. And whatever happened to Momotumbo's 